Hello, we're starting a brand new series today where we're going to talk about the life of King David and what we can learn and apply from it. David was a king of Israel who had a huge influence on Israel's history. Even today, you can go and pay your respects by his coffin in Jerusalem. And David was a lot of things and he ended up being the king. The Bible introduces us to him when he's a boy, but ultimately he lived in a very violent time. In fact, it's really hard for us to get our minds and our hearts around the kind of world that David lived in, especially when it comes to ancient warfare. When we read about accounts of historical wars, either in the Bible or in other accounts, we're a programme to glamorise it. We fictionalise it, we sanitise it, we romanticise it and we do all kinds of things, mainly because of what our minds can process, but also because Hollywood has helped us. Think of Ben-Hur, Braveheart, Saving Private Ryan, Gladiator, more recently 1917. These films provide us with an understanding and the graphics that have progressed with each of the films about what it was like, but they've got more and more detail to the point that we think we're there. But even on Hollywood's best day, there's no way it can take us into the world of ancient warfare because you have to smell it and you have to fear it for yourself, something that most of us, fortunately, will never even have to get close to. But even those that get close never get as close as the men, and in some cases, even the women of ancient warfare, because the news footage or the films we see are from a distance. They're drones, helicopters, jets, and the lens of a camera. In ancient days, you saw warfare over the edge of your own shield with your stomach in your throat. In modern warfare, we mainly kill from a distance. In ancient warfare, you killed at arm's length. You actually looked into the eyes of your opponent. You smelled their breath and you knew if they'd had something to drink. You knew what they'd had to eat and you were so close. You saw fear, you saw terror and you saw savagery. The odds of you walking away alive were very, very low. And only after the battle would you know what your, your own wounds were because the adrenaline rush had kept you going. And after, as you checked your body, you were never sure if the blood that was on you was yours or your opponent's. And if it was yours and you were able to stop the bleeding, the chances are you would die of some sort of infection. In fact, in ancient times, men often fought completely naked because although they, they didn't quite understand germs and all of that business, but they did understand that material touching wounds was not good and that would result in losing a limb or your life. And if you, your brother to the left or the, to the right of you had lost their courage and they turned and ran, you would most certainly die on the battlefield. And before anyone could come and take your body and rescue your body or bury you, the birds of the air and the beasts of the field would be there to prey upon your flesh. Well, if I haven't put you off or made you feel sick, I hope you're not eating. Let's get into why we needed to know this to set the scene and find out more about David. <coughs> the account we're going to look in at is in 1 Samuel chapter 17. And the Philistines had gathered their forces for war and assembled a Sokar in Judah. And Saul and the Israelites had camped in the Valley of Elah. Essentially, the Philistines were occupying one hill and the Israelites were on another. And there was a valley between them. And in verse four, it says, and a champion named Goliath, who was from Gath, came out of the Philistine camp and he was over nine feet tall and he had a bronze helmet on his head and he wore a coat of scale armour of bronze weighing 5,000 shekels. And on his legs, he wore bronze greaves and a bronze javelin was slung on his back. His spear shaft was like that of a weaver's rod and his iron point weighed 600 shekels. Goliath was a big killing machine. Everything about his presentation meant he was there, not to just intimidate, but to kill. And he looks at the Israelites and he says, why do you come out and line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine and you're not the servants of Saul? Choose a man and have him come down to me. And if he's able to fight and kill me, we will become your subjects. But if I overcome him and kill him, you will become our subjects and serve us. On hearing the Philistine words, Saul and all the Israelites were dismayed and terrified. Israel needed a champion and they looked to their king, King Saul, for two reasons. Number one, he was the king. And number two, King Saul was the tallest man in Israel. So when a giant walks into the valley and challenges the nation of Israel, the armies of Israel look to the tallest guy, their king. 
and they had placed their hope in their king as they should have done. And by placing their hope in their king, they waited for the king to come out of his tent and to challenge Goliath. That's where their hope lay. And this is where our story begins to intersect with the story from the Old Testament, because here's what's true of you and what's true of me. We place our hope in what we depend on. We place our hope in who we depend on. And when the person that we place our hope in disappoints us, often the measure of our hope becomes the measure of our disdain or the measure of our anger. Certainly, it's the measure of our disappointment. And it's why we often get disappointed with people. Saul in the story is conspicuously missing. His credibility slipped away as each day passed with no response. And as his credibility waned, the army's hope died. Now, the thing is, God did not want Israel to have a king. God wanted Israel to look to him to be the king because God knew that wherever you place your trust, that's where you place your hope. And God wanted Israel to place their hope in him. In fact, about 400 years before this event, God established Israel as a theocracy, basically a nation of laws that was administered by judges, that God would be the king and God would give the law and the judges would administer the law. And that's how this set apart people, Israel, would function. This idea of no king was revolutionary ahead of its time because every nation had a king and hence why Israel wanted one. But look where we are now with so many countries not having a king or a queen. Israel had looked around and they decided that they too needed a king. And so they complained to their leading authority, Samuel, who was a prophet. And here's what happened. This is just a few years before this incident with Goliath. And you can read about the full story in 1 Samuel chapter 8. Samuel was growing old, so he appointed his sons as Israel judges because he knew that he didn't have many years left and he needed to replace himself. So he replaced himself with his sons, but his sons did not follow his ways and they were corrupt. And yet they were the judges. So all the elders of Israel gathered together and they came to Samuel at Ramah and they said to him, you are old and your sons do not follow your ways. Now appoint a king to lead us, such as all the other nations have. But here was the thing that they forgot. And here's what so complicates the story of the Old Testament and unfortunately continues to complicate things for the church today. God established Israel for a very specific purpose, a purpose which went way beyond Israel. Going back in time again to when God had made a promise to a man named Abraham and he said, Abraham, through your descendants, I'm going to bless not just you, not just your family, not just the nation. I'm going to bless the entire world. And God had a very, very specific purpose and agenda for Israel. And God wanted Israel to be unlike any other nation so that in their success and in their wealth and through all the things that would happen in Israel, the surrounding nations would look at Israel and say, who is your God? Who is this unique God that protects the borders of the land and that causes their crops to grow, that causes their babies to be born and to live long lives? Who is their God? And through the nation of Israel, God would in fact bless the world. And eventually there would be a king, but only one king, the King Jesus. The story continues. Samuel wasn't happy, but he goes to speak to God about the people's requests. And the Lord told him, listen to all that the people are saying to you. It's not you that they have rejected, but they have rejected me as their king. And God says, OK, let them have a king. But he also wanted Samuel to warn the people that it will come at a great price because the king is going to tax you. He's going to take a percentage of your crops. He's going to take a percentage of your herds. He's going to draft your sons and he's going to force your daughters to serve him. He's going to claim the blessed land. And yet, in spite of all the warnings, the elders insisted, we want a king. But the interesting thing is the nation's insistence Israel's insistence and it set the stage for one of the most detailed narrative accounts in all of ancient literature is set the stage for the story of King David, Israel's second king. He was by no means perfect. He was arguably Israel's greatest king because as we'll see there was something in him that was reluctant. There was something in him that was extraordinarily confident but there was something in him that was extraordinarily humble as well. 
And unlike the average king, David actually loved the law. Kings typically did not love laws. Kings loved to be the law. In fact, when a king broke the law, they would often adjust the law to match the words of the king because the king's words were usually the final words. And yet throughout his reign, we discover that David loved the law, even when the law condemned him. And instead of changing the law or adjusting the law, David allowed himself to be broken over God's law. And throughout the literature that he wrote and throughout the songs he wrote, he declares that he loves God's law because he believed in the fact that Israel law was a law that God had given the nation. And that conviction, and this is the big takeaway for many of us today, that conviction provided him with extraordinary clarity as king. Throughout his imperfect reign, he was never confused. David was never confused about the identity of Israel's true king. He never was confused about his limited role. And in spite of his popularity, in spite of his talent, in spite of his success, and in spite of his extraordinary power, he was never, ever confused. For many of us, that's not the case. Success confuses the best of us. A little bit of success and the next thing you know, we're sitting on the throne of our lives. A little bit of sales success, a little bit of family success, a little bit of parenting success, a little bit of financial success and a little bit of academic success, a little bit of success in some hobby or some talent. And the next thing you know, we're sitting on the throne of our lives. And once... We're on the throne of our lives. We place our hope in us because we place our hope in the one we depend upon the most. David, the king of Israel, never made that mistake. In fact, we catch a glimpse of this extraordinarily perspective when he was a 15 year old shepherd boy trying to stay out of the way of his older brothers who fought for King Saul. So go back. Let's go back to the Goliath story. On hearing the Philistines' words, Saul and all the Israelites were dismayed and they were terrified. And whilst this is going on, 15-year-old David shows up with some food from home. And like any curious young teenager, he makes his way to the front of the lines because something is going on. And he hears Goliath's taunts and he hears Goliath's speech. It's the same speech that he gives twice a day. This has been going on now for over a month and David responds. But instead of being dismayed and terrified, David is offended and he hears that Saul is looking for a champion to fight Goliath and he begins to ask questions. Questions that allow us to see that David saw with a clarity that no one else in Saul's army had, including King Saul himself. And David asked the men standing near him, what will be done for the man who kills this Philistine and removes this disgrace from Israel? And these men of war looking at this teenage boy saying, why do you ask? What do you mean? And then they realised David saw things from a different perspective to them. All they could see was a nine and a half foot tall giant with extraordinary experience, a veteran of many battles. And they had forgotten who they were. And David says this, who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? Nobody had asked that question. Nobody had seen it this way, uncircumcised Philistine. That meant that Goliath was outside of the covenant of God, outside of his protection. Who does he think he is? And why in the world hasn't somebody done something about this? Wow. The word gets back to King Saul that somebody is actually talking about going down there and fighting this giant. That there's somebody, perhaps in the army, who's finally raised their hand and volunteered for what undoubtedly would be his last day on the planet. And so he calls David in. And when David walks in, he's immediately disappointed. He's no soldier and there's nothing to indicate that he's ever even been in a battle before. And Saul discovers that David is a shepherd and the younger brother of three of his veteran soldiers. And Saul sits down and he dismisses David. And David says, wait, King Saul, before you let me go, I understand I'm just a shepherd. I understand I have no military experience. I don't even have any weapons. I'm a shepherd, it's true, but one day while I was shepherding my father's sheep, a lion came and he took one of the sheep. And instead of doing what most shepherds do and just accepting that I've lost one sheep and just protecting the rest, I went after the lion and I took the sheep and I killed that lion. And not too long after that, a bear did the same thing. And instead of protecting the rest of the flock, I went after that one lamb and I took that lamb and I killed the bear. 
and your servant. Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear and this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them. Not because I'm a soldier, not because I have military experience, but because God. Why can't you see that this giant is defying the armies of the living God and the Lord who rescued me from the lion and the bear will rescue me from the hand of this Philistine? Absolutely no confusion for David. He just sees it in a way that no one else saw it. He had extraordinary clarity and the clarity was simply this. An enemy of God's people is an enemy of God. And Goliath isn't simply defying this army. Goliath is defying God. Simple. David's assumption was this, that the man or woman whose hope is in the Lord need not fear, even when there is something to be afraid of. And so he said, King Saul, pick me, choose me, let me do what no man in your army is willing to do. Let me do what you as king are unwilling to do yourself. And the interesting thing is this, that later David would become king, as we know. And as king, he would write. He was a poet, a psalmist, and he wrote songs. And so we don't only have the narrative. That's what's so fascinating about the story. We don't simply have what David did and what David said through the psalms. We get inside of his mind and we get inside of his emotions. We understand how he thought. And later on, he would document this incredible perspective and he would write these words. To you, O Lord, I lift my soul, in you I trust. Where's David's trust? Is it in talent, power, ability? In his influence as king? No, David says, I have placed my trust in the Lord. This was the posture that God desired for the entire nation and they just wouldn't stay there. They wanted a king, but in their second king, they found a man who understood the perspective that God wanted the entire nation to maintain. And in this king, we discover a man who maintained a perspective that your heavenly father wants you to maintain and he wants me to maintain throughout our life. Go back to the, let's go back to the story. 15 years old, clear eyed, confident, and yet in some strange way, humble. And he makes his way down to the valley of Elah and the Philistines see him. It's a boy. It's a boy with no armour. Is this a joke? In meanwhile, we can't imagine what the soldiers who were fighting for King Saul thought. It's a boy. It's a boy who's going to represent the armies of Israel. And Goliath has made a deal. If we lose, we become the servants of the Philistines. King Saul has allowed a boy to represent us. And Goliath repeats his threats and David waits. And then he looks at Goliath and he says, you come against me with a sword and a spear and a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. And David goes on to say that he will strike Goliath down. And then I will feed the carcasses of the host of the Philistines this day to the birds of the air and the beasts of the field, that the whole earth would know that there is a God in Israel. And this assembly will know that the Lord is not saved by sword or by javelin or by spear, for this battle is the Lord's. And Goliath, he will deliver you into my hands. And then he killed him. And he instantly became the most popular person in the nation of Israel. And he became the most feared man amongst the Philistines. David had simply done what King Saul failed to do because David saw something that King Saul could not see. And so it is with those who hope is in the Lord. They see clearly, they act confidently, but they walk humbly. They recognise that they can't control outcomes because there are too many variables outside of their control. That people who walk humbly with God, they wake up every day and they realise I can't control outcomes because there are too many variables that are outside of my control. So instead they do this, they lean the weight of their life against the one who has the whole world and all the variables in his hands. And they declare with David every morning, in you, Lord, my God, I put my trust. My hope is in you all day long. Wherever you are right now, and even if you're not really a Christian, not really sure about all of this God stuff, this is a powerful, powerful statement. And it takes us right to the epicentre of the entire story that we're going to look at over this series. Because I want to encourage you to say every morning, in you, Lord, my God, I put my trust. My hope is in you all day long. Wake up every day and say it. Say it during the day and when you go to bed at night. And in those moments when it looks like the world has turned against you and that Goliath will in fact take you down instead of the opposite, whisper under your breath, in you, Lord my God, I put my trust, my hope is in you all day long. 
I've never been able to control outcomes because I have no control over the variables that determine outcomes. That was David, an imperfect king and an imperfect man, but who never ever throughout his reign turned his back on the law of God and the God of his ancestors. Whatever you are facing right now, and we all seem to be facing something in this pandemic, try saying these words. I put my trust and my hope in the Lord every moment and every day. As I'm recording this message, the UK death toll has just passed 100,000 and it may feel that the tide of despair is ready to wash over us, but we can grasp the gift of hope every morning by declaring who our hope is in. Every day, God invites us to be like a 15 year old shepherd boy and put our trust and our hope in him. We don't have to try and be strong, we are weak, but we get to lean on the armies of God and let them battle for us. Can you imagine the relief, the freedom, the renewal that comes with going, God, I can't handle this. Can you do it? And leaving it there and walking away. Place your hope in the Lord. There is no other healthy way. David was in fact Israel's greatest king because as king, he never confused himself with the king. And as it turns out, David, we've considered Israel's greatest king, even though he was so flawed. His hope, even as king, was in the Lord. But in his early years, that was not always the case. And we're going to pick it up, the story, right there next week. So do come back and join us. But first, let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we're not alone. In, even in today, you are with us fighting our battles. But Lord, we thank you for these ancient narratives that we can look at and learn of how you have been a faithful and a just God and that you never leave us or forsake us and that you have given us the ultimate King, King Jesus, who we give our lives to every day. And in his name we pray. Amen. That's it for this week, folks. Go in peace. Remember to subscribe so that you know when the next episode is coming out. And I look forward to seeing you soon. Take care and God bless.